Hello and welcome to the second section of lectures on explicit memory storage. Well, I'm Ali Reza and this lecture is actually the main lecture in the, in, uh, in the uh, series of lectures on explicit memory. So let's see what we have in this lecture. Well, uh, previously in section one, I talked about the, the structure of the hippocampus. I also talked about and introduced the concepts of induction and expressions of LTP. And I also introduced the concept of silent synapses. <coughs> now this section and this lecture, uh, you know, in this lecture, I'm going to talk about the early and late phases of LTP. And also I'm going to talk about the role of LTP in, in the formation and consolidation of memory, okay? so. Let's start. Okay, uh, so this chart here, uh, it, it tells us the, uh, the amount of potentiation of field DPSPs in CA1 area of the hippocampus and it, uh, in, in two different phases of LTP, uh, early phase and late phase of LTP. Sorry. And it also tells us how, how long it may, uh, <clears throat> the potentiation may last in early and late LTP. You can see that uh, in order to induce uh, early LTP, we can actually apply one titanic stimulation, okay? And each titanic stimulation is actually represented by these arrows. So one titanic stimulation, uh, this uh, blue arrow, uh, it's going to cause the early LTP. And this early LTP, as you can see in this chart, may last, well, one or two hours, okay? But when we repeat that titanic stimulation three or four times, okay, when we have four trains of titanic stimulation, we induce, of course, a larger uh, potentiation in uh, EPSPs, and we have a larger uh, and a greater LTP, and that late LTP is going to last up to eight hours, okay, and the, only the very first three hours are shown here, but it may last up to eight hours. So. <clears throat> Uh, when we repeat that titanic stimulation, we actually get late LTP that lasts longer. So this is uh, uh, just uh, the, the, the duration of early and late LTP. Scientists uh, also found out that, you know, early LTP does not require uh, protein synthesis. You know, we can, we can inhibit protein synthesis and still get early LTP, okay? As you can see here, you know, <clears throat> we have a control uh, <clears throat> experiment in which we, do, we try to uh, in induce early LTP, but we do not in inhibit the protein synthesis, synthesis uh, sorry, synthesis. And we have another experiment in which we inhibit protein, uh, protein synthesis and we try to induce LT, uh, early LTP by one titanic stimulation, as you can see by this one arrow. <coughs> you can see that when, you know, there's almost no difference <coughs> in these two uh, results, you know. Uh, even if we, uh, you know, completely uh, inhibit the protein synthesis by an isomycin, uh, an inhibitor of the protein synthesis, we can still get early LTP. <clears throat> and this bar actually indicates the application of uh, an isomycin during the protocol, which, is, which was used for, uh, you know, inducing early LTP. But in this chart, you can see that when we actually try to induce uh, late LTP by these three arrows, which represent three trains of uh, titanic stimulation. And when we apply <coughs> this uh, anisomycin, the inhibitor of protein synthesis, you can see that the potentiation, the, the late phase of LTP and the potentiation caused in late uh, LTP uh, declines over time, okay? So the maintenance and the <coughs> basically the expression of late LTP requires protein synthesis. Well, it's clear, of course. Well, early and late LTP is somewhat similar to uh, short-term and long-term sensitization. You know, in short-term sensitization, we didn't need, we don't need, we don't uh, need uh, protein synthesis. But in long-term sensitization, we had protein synthesis for, for <clears throat> you know, some, uh, you know, effectors for synaptic growth and some other uh, functional proteins. So, 
Uh, and this is, we, we have the same concept here, we have the same thing for late LTP. If we want to induce late LTP, we need the protein, uh, protein synthesis. We need the uh, synth synthesis of new proteins, which are important for uh, growth of new synaptic connections and other functions. So <clears throat> let's see what happens in early and late LTP in much more detail. Let's talk about the, basically the molecular mechanisms of, of early and late LTP. Well, I'm going to talk about the first early LTP and then late LTP. This is a very large picture. I had to do, you know, divide it into two slides. So first I'm going to talk about this part and then I'm going to talk about this part, okay? So let's see what happens in, uh, during the induction or expression of early LTP first. So <clears throat> I told you that, first of all, this neuron, this presynaptic neuron is the presynaptic, uh, 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 basically the uh, axon terminal of CA3 pyramidal neurons. This is a Schaefer collateral synapse. And uh, as we remember, we have uh, our presynaptic neuron and Schaefer collateral synapse is, comes from the uh, CA3 uh, pyramidal cells. And the postsynaptic neuron is just a dendritic spine of pyramidal cells in CA1 area. So let's see what we have. I told you that in order to apply, <coughs> or sorry, induce um, LALTP in at a synapse, we use a one train of the channel stimulation that lasts one second at a frequency of 100 hertz. Okay, so it's a very high frequency stimulation. Well, when we um, apply that titanic stimulation, for once, of course, because we are trying to uh, induce early LTP, we have a large uh, release, uh, a great release of glutamate, <coughs> okay, in the synaptic cleft. We have, uh, you know, a large number of AMPA receptors are activated. And these AMPA receptors are going to cause a large depolarization in the postsynaptic terminal. And we know that the glutamate and the postsynaptic depolarization are necessary to activate um, the NMDA receptors. And now we have both of them. We have the glutamate and a large depolarization in the postsynaptic terminal thanks to these AMPA receptors. And so the magnesium ion... Uh, <coughs> Magnesium blockade, actually, of these NMDA receptors is relieved, and now these NMDA receptors are activated. As a result of the activation of NMDA receptors, we have uh, an influx of calcium ions into the postsynaptic terminal. And the, these calcium ions, you know, they are going to activate a, a calcium cascade or calcium signaling by activating calcium calmodulin protein. And the calcium calmodulin triggers a bunch of biochemical reactions. You know, you know it activates uh, enzymes, including kinase enzymes, like protein kinase C, tyrosine kinase, uh, cal cam kinase 2. It also activates uh, uh, nitric oxide. Sorry I pronounced uh, nitric oxide, nitric oxide. You know, nitric is the Persian pronunciation of nitric. And uh, in the previous lecture, I was just thinking about in uh, the Persian pronunciation. The Persian is my first language and you know I was talking I, I was thinking about that so sorry about that the correct pronunciation is nitric oxide uh, <clears throat> and this nitric oxide synthase is going to produce nitric oxide um, this nitric oxide gets out of the post uh, synaptic terminal get, and you know gets to the uh, presynaptic terminal and acts as a retrograde messenger so, and this retrograde messenger nitric oxide, or uh, it can also get out of the cell in a form of proxy nitride. It enhances the transmitter release in the presynaptic terminal. So this is one of the changes that happen, one of the changes that happens during the induction of early LTP, okay? Uh, calcium gets in through the NMDA receptors. Calcium calmodulin activates the uh, n uh, nitric oxide synthase that gets out of the cell uh, in the form of a uh, retrograde messenger, and it enhances the transmitter release in the presynaptic cell, or terminal, sorry. Another change is that, which happens uh, during the induction of early LTP is that we have an enhanced current through these AMPA receptors, in part by the insertion of these new AMPA receptors in the post-terminal, uh, sorry, post-synaptic terminal membrane, or the post-synaptic membrane, okay? So, 
Two things happen during the uh, induction of early LTP. First, we have an enhanced current 30 ampere receptors because we have new ampere receptors inserted into the postsynaptic terminal. And then we have an enhanced transmitter release thanks to that retrograde messenger nitric oxide or proxy nitride. But what happens, so this is, <clears throat> this is about early LTP. Let's see what happens during late LTP. I told you that late LTP, if you want to induce late LTP, we, 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 we have to repeat that titanic stimulation three or four times. When we do that, we have a very large influx, uh, <clears throat> influx or very large uh, or prolonged influx or presence of calcium ions in the cell. And that causes a prolonged activity of calcium cut modulating. During the induction of late phase of LTP, the calcium cut modulating actually recruits adenine cyclase. We all know what it does. Adenine cyclase produces a second messenger CAMP. The CAMP then acts as a re uh, uh, on a regulatory subunit of or domain of uh, protein kinase A. It activates this catalytic subunit, and the catalytic subunit goes uh, and translocates to the cell nucleus and phosphorylates CREB1. And we all know CREB1 is a transcription factor. It's activated by, uh, by phosphorylation. And once it is activated, it's going to activate and triggers the transcription of a specific genes, which encode some important proteins or, uh, called effectors, which are important for the growth of new synaptic connections. So I'm actually going to uh, introduce two of those effectors uh, <clears throat> later in this lecture. So I explained that very fast because we, all, we are all familiar with this uh, signaling pathway. And you can see that you know, we have uh, transcription, translation, so we have protein synthesis okay, in late phase of LTP. So this is um, <clears throat> one of the uh, things that, happen, uh, that happens during late LTP. And you can see we have protein synthesis here. Another thing that happens or uh, occurs during the induction of late LTP is the local dendritic translation of the mRNA of protein kinase M zeta. You know, the mRNA of protein kinase M zeta already, is already present in the, uh, at, the, at the spine. So when we want to induce late LTP, uh, the, the presence of these mRNAs at the spine uh, causes the, the induction or expression of LTP uh, to happen sooner, okay? And, well, we have the mRNA of protein kinase M zeta, but what is protein kinase M zeta? Well, protein kinase M zeta is, the, is a constantly active form of protein kinase C. You know, the reason it is called, the reason it is constantly active is because it lacks the regulatory uh, domain. A normal protein kinase C, just like protein kinase A, has a regulatory domain and a catalytic domain. The regulatory domain of protein kinase A is detached or inhibited by CAMP. Uh, <clears throat> However, the, the regulatory domain of protein kinase C is de uh, deactivated somehow by uh, diacylglycerol, uh, uh, specific phospholipid, and calcium ions. But you can see that I'm going to show you actually why this protein kinase M zeta uh, lacks the regulatory domain. But it lacks the regulatory domain, doesn't have it, so it only has the catalytic domain. So it is always active, okay? And that, you know, the uh, translation of its mRNA is going to, um, and the presence of a constantly active uh, form of protein kinase C, protein kinase M zeta, is going to, uh, you know, leads to the long-lasting increase in the inser uh, insertion of AMPA receptors into postsynaptic terminal. So, yeah, so we have two protein synthesis. First, we have a protein synthesis activated by protein kinase A, CAMP signaling pathway, protein kinase A and CREB1. And then we have a protein synthesis related to the synthesis and the translation of the local mRNA, uh, local translation of the mRNA of protein kinase M zeta. <coughs> and this is why uh, for late LTP, we need, we need protein synthesis. Okay, um, you know, a note on the retrograde signaling and that nitric, nitric oxide, sorry. I told you that NMDA receptors are activated and then calcium ions 
get in and calcium ions uh, activate calcium calmodulin. The calcium calmodulin activates in nitric oxide synthase. Nitric oxide synthesizes nitric, uh, uh, nitric oxide uh, synthase uh, synthesizes nitric oxide. And the nitric oxide may get out of the cell, get out of the cell, get out of the sorry, uh, the postsynaptic terminal in the form of a uh, superoxide or proxy nitride. And this proxy nitride oxidizes the protein kinase C in the presynaptic terminal. And somehow by that oxidation, protein kinase C is activated. Well, sometimes protein kinase C, which is activated, may directly uh, increase the release of transmitters neurotransmitters in the, uh, from the uh, presynaptic terminal. Sometimes it, it does that indirectly by first activating a, a growth uh, <clears throat> associated protein 43, which is basically um, you know, associated with the calcium calmodulin and together they both, uh, you know, together they increase the release of neurotransmitters from the postsynaptic, presynaptic terminal. So basically what that retrograde signal does, a retrograde messenger does, whether it is in the form of a, a nitric oxide or a super nitri uh, superoxide as a proxy nitride, it oxidizes and by doing that activates protein kinase C in the presynaptic terminal and that protein kinase C uh, <clears throat> sometimes directly and sometimes directly increases or enhances the release of neurotransmitters. So I just wanted to tell you that. Okay, let's talk about the protein kinase C and the, 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 you know, the structure of that atypical form of protein kinase C, protein kinase M zeta. So you can see the domain structures of different isoforms of protein kinase C, <coughs> protein kinase C sorry. We have uh, uh, classical isoforms and normal isoforms of protein kinase C. I told you that we have, in a normal protein kinase C, we have a regulatory domain and a catalytic domain. You know, in the regulatory domain, we have a phospholipid side, we have a calcium side, and that's why we need calcium and a specific phospholipid and diacylglycerol to uh, uh, inhibit the regulatory domain and to activate a catalytic domain. And in the catalytic domain, of course, we have a site for ATP and a substrate. <coughs> because it's a kinase enzyme, of course. Uh, it adds phosphates to uh, specific proteins or substrates. And, we, and these dots are autophosphorylation sites. We have novel forms of protein kinase C, novel isoforms. You can see that they still have that phospholipid domain of, uh, or subunit of the regulatory domain. But we have an atypical form, some atypical forms or isoforms of protein kinase C, and the zeta is one of them. You can see that we almost, we have almost no regulatory domain, okay? And we, uh, you know, in, in protein kinase M zeta, we only have the hinge and the catalytic subunit or domain. Let's see why this happens. Let's see how uh, the atypical isoform of protein kinase C is, is uh, synthesized in the cell. This is uh, an exon-intron structure of the protein kinase C uh, zeta gene. It is approximately 10 kilo, uh, kilobase pairs. You can see that we have two clusters of exons, which are separated by this large intron. Uh, exons 1 to 4, okay, they encode 5 prime UTR, and these red exons, they encode the uh, regulatory domain. <coughs> UTR, of course you know, but I didn't know that, so I'm just going to tell you what, uh, what do I get from UTR. Uh, what do I know about UTR? I think UTR, well, um, it stands for untranslated region. Well, of course, it's going to be transcribed, but it's not going to be translated into the protein. Of course, hence the name, you know, untranslated region. But it has some regulatory functions, I think. I read somewhere that it has some regulatory functions. For example, it determines, the, it, uh, it determines when the translation will occur, and it also determines the general stability of the entire mRNA. So it has some important regulatory functions, although it is not going to be translated into the protein. So we have 5' prime UTR, and some of these, uh, you know, uh, re uh, exons which encode uh, regulatory domain and um, on the right we have 
another cluster of exons that regulate that uh, encode the rest of the regulatory domain. We have these red one, uh, sorry, these yellow exons which encode the hinge part of the protein kind of C. We have these green ones which encode the catalytic part or domain of the protein kind of C, and we have these gray ones or this gray one at the end, which is the three prime uh, UTR. And this is a normal gene. Well, you know, uh, the transcription of the normal protein kinase C zeta starts at exon 1, okay? And that uh, results in the full-length mRNA that generates the full-length mRNA of protein kinase C, okay? And when it is translated, we have... Uh, a f that generates a full-length protein, okay? We have the regulatory domain as well as the catalytic domain plus the hinge, of course, okay? But here's the fun, here's the fun part. Protein kinase M zeta, its transcription starts at this exon, exon 1 prime, this, blue, uh, this uh, dark blue one, uh, exon 1 prime, okay? When a translation starts at exon 1 prime, and not at what exon one, when and uh, you know the translation, the tr sorry, the transcription starts at exon one prime, and then we splice to exon five. We get the mRNA of protein kinase M zeta that generates uh, the mRNA of protein kinase M zeta, and the translation of the mRNA of protein kinase M zeta starts at the hinge. Okay. You can see that we have the 5-UTR, we have the AUG, and you can see the start codon or AUG starts at the hinge. That's why after the translation, we have an, in, you know, uh, an atypical form of protein kinase C, protein kinase M zeta, that it lacks the regulatory domain, okay? And it only has the, has the hinge and a catalytic domain. That's why it is always active, because it doesn't have that regulatory domain. And that's why it doesn't have it, because its translation, sorry, its transcription of, of its gene starts at exon 1 prime. And you can see exon 1 prime, you know, is after those exons that encode the regulatory domain, okay? That, that, that's very beautiful, and we just wanted to, you know, I have this question in my mind that why this happens, why uh, protein kinase M zeta doesn't have that regulatory domain, and this is why. I'm, just wanted to answer that question of mine. Okay. So the rest of the picture, you know, it's just, uh, I don't need to show you that, but I just wanted to show you the factors that are uh, synthesized by, you know, uh, you know, the, these effectors are specific proteins which are important for the growth of new synaptic connections. And these effectors are uh, synthesized as a result of that calcium, uh, sorry, uh, CAMP protein kinase M, uh, protein kinase A, and CREB1 uh, signaling. Okay, CREB1 activates the transcription of these uh, effector proteins. We also have, you know, these protein kinase M zetas, they're also going to in, uh, insert new amper receptors in the newly formed synaptic spines or the spines or synaptic connections. Okay, so uh, this is, uh, this picture shows us the same thing that I showed you in previous slides, but it has two uh, important things that I want to uh, point here. You know, first of all, <coughs> Uh, it tells us uh, about uh, two of those effector proteins that are synthesized as a result of that, uh, the activation of CREP1. One of them is tissue plasminogen activator, which, is, which promotes the synaptic growth. The other one is BDNF, or brain-derived uh, <clears throat> neurotrophic factor, which is basically, I think, it's a neuro, uh, nerve growth factor. It's a growth factor, uh, and together, plus other effectors, they act on, uh, you know, they, they causes the formation of new synaptic uh, uh, connections, okay? Uh, another thing in this picture that I want to point out is, is this calcineurin, you know? As well as these calcium calmodulin dependent kinase enzymes, we have some, t uh, some of these uh, calcineurins. These are calcineurin is a calcium calmodulin dependent serine and threonine phosphatase, uh, unlike the calcium... Uh, Cam, cam, uh, cam kinase, it's a calcium calmodulin dependent phosphatase. And uh, it acts as a constraint, you know, it sometimes activates a bunch of phosphatase enzymes that are going to dephosphorylate CREP1. 
protein. And in previous slides, in, um, in previous lectures in, uh, <coughs> uh, on implicit memory, I told you that CREP1, it is phosphorylated, and by phosphorylation, it, it is activated, okay? And when it is dephosphorylated, so it is deactivated. And these calcium, uh, calcineurin and phosphatase enzymes, they deactivate the CREP1, and by doing that, they, they inhibit the, or uh, prevent the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, transcription of these effector proteins. So we have these constraints, as well as those uh, functional proteins activated by calcium calmodulin. And removing these constraints, uh, you know, may lower the threshold for, for the induction of late LTP, and it enhances the memory storage. So, <clears throat> yeah, that's, uh, uh, oh, that, that's uh, <sighs> the other thing that I wanted to tell you uh, about this, the whole molecular mechanism. Okay, fine. Scientists then asked uh, a question. After all of this, these discoveries on the molecular um, mechanisms underlying the synaptic plasticity, scientists asked that, is it really true that synaptic plasticity is the underlying me uh, mechanism or the mechanistic basis of uh, <clears throat> learning and memory? Well, it's a very uh, thought-provoking question. Uh, I first encountered this question in a book called From Molecules to Networks. Uh, it's an introduction to cellular and molecular neuroscience. And uh, two scientists, Martin and Morris, in 2002, they proposed four criteria uh, <clears throat> that they need to be checked, these, uh, criteria, these uh, criteria need to be uh, checked if that statement is true, if synaptic plasticity is really the underlying mechanism or the mechanistic basis of learning and memory. What are those uh, criteria? Well, the first cri uh, criteria is detectability. Martin and Morris said that, okay, if this statement is true, the, st the statement I just told you, if this statement is true, then those physical alterations as a result of the formation of new memories and synaptic, uh, as an induction or expression of synaptic plasticity should be experimentally detectable. And during these lectures, both in, <coughs> you know, I showed you, you know, a lot of experiments scientists did and proved that we have some detectable uh, structural and physical changes as a result of line term synaptic uh, changes, you know, as a result, for example, in line term sensitization, we have the presence or the formation of new synaptic varicosities. And in line term habituation, for example, we have synaptic pruning, okay, the number of detectable synaptic contacts uh, decreased is decreased in, in, in habituation, long-term habituation. In, in uh, LTP, I told you that in late phase of LTP, we have the growth of new synaptic connections, okay? So uh, the first criteria is, uh, criterion is passed, you know, uh, detectability is passed. We can detect those physical alterations, physical changes as a result of synaptic plasticity. The second one is mimicry. Well, at the time, at that time, they proposed, they, they were really skeptical and they, didn't, they couldn't believe that, uh, you know, it can be possible. But mimicry, you know, by mimicry they mean that, okay, uh, if the synaptic plasticity is the underlying mechanism of learning and memory, then we should be able to install new memories by changing the uh, pattern of synapses, the pattern of synaptic weights, by changing the weights of synapses in a, in a pattern of neurons, in a circuit of neurons. Recently, scientists had successfully installed a false memory in the hippocampus of a, of a mouse by, you know, manipulating the n-gram bearing neurons. N-gram uh, is just a network of neurons that uh, encode uh, information or memories uh, <clears throat> and store memories. 
Uh, and they did that. They changed the some uh, synapses um, and some neurons and uh, manipulated those neurons, uh, the n-gram bearing neurons, or those neurons participating in uh, the memory uh, encoding or memory storing n-grams by optogenetic methods. And the optogenetic is a, a very fun method, very uh, interesting method. But you know, you we can activate uh, specific neurons in a specific neural circuits by shining lights on them. You know, we have some light sensitive uh, ion channels, okay, and they, when they receive a, a specific uh, spectrum of light, you know, they're open and then we, we can activate uh, uh, that neuron. It's very beautiful. And so, even mimicry is, is, is passed, you know, scientists prove that it is possible by changing the, uh, the pattern of synaptic weights uh, in, a, in, a, in a memory engram, we can install new memories. It's interesting. And the third one is anterograde alteration. Well, uh, Martin and Morris said that, okay, if this statement is true, if we prevent the synaptic plasticity, we should also, that should prevent the formation of new memories. And for example, uh, this is also possible, you know, in pharmacological studies, when we inhibit LTP, for example, or induction or expression of uh, synaptic plasticity, we also prevent uh, the formation of new memories. So this is also true. And the last one is retro, retro, uh, ret, uh, retrograde, sorry, retrograde uh, alteration. And in retrograde alteration, uh, you know, uh, what scientists mean by that is that <clears throat> if we alter the newly formed memories, that alteration should erase or alter the animal's memory of that specific event. Uh, and this is also possible. For example, by reversing the LTP, we can alter those synaptic changes, and that, should, that alteration should, uh, uh, in theory, and in practice, I think, uh, change the or alter the uh, memory of that specific event. So yeah. Uh, this was a very interesting question, you know, I thought that maybe scientists uh, <clears throat> uh, was really sure that synaptic plasticity is the underlying mechanis uh, mechanism or the mechanistic basis of, of uh, learning and memory, but it turns out that, uh, well, there, uh, there are some scientists that are really uh, skeptical about this. Okay, now I want to talk about the role of LTP memory consolidation. You know, before doing research, for these lectures, I thought that mem you know LTP equals memory. Then I realized that this statement is, is wrong. You know, LTP is not a memory storage mechanism. LTP is basically a, a memory buffer. And uh, <clears throat> the uh, the storage of hippocampus dependent uh, uh, memories uh, happen happens. Uh, in my in our cerebral cortices in the cerebral cortex and different uh, cortical areas, and uh, the information or the memory in, uh, in the hippocampus is represented as a pattern of synaptic waves, as a pattern of potentiated and modified uh, synapses. And now let's talk about. Let's see. I want to uh, introduce uh, uh, you know a model which uh, demonstrates how. Uh, hippocampus forms memories and how the memories are stored uh, in the cortex. This is, of course, a very simplified uh, <coughs> model. It's an oversimplified model, actually. So let's see what, it ha what we have here in, in this model. We have the hippocampus here. It receives some sensory input from different areas uh, associated of, of the cortex associated with the hippocampus. It also receives uh, some neuromodulatory signals, uh, those signals which are, you know, related to the attention, uh, emotion, and arousal. Arousal, and then it also uh, the hippocampus also re receives some consolidation signals. Those, uh, you know, consolidation signal is all is all about that baseline neuronal activity which is necessary for the consolidation of memories. I'm going to talk more about it. And then the output of the circuit of my hippocampus are going to project it, are going to be projected to enterona and perona cortices, and from there, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, they ultimately go to the output of the hippocampus. Ultimately, goes to the cerebral cortex. The entirety of the cerebral cortex is reduced down to two neurons. You know, this is how simplified this model is. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, the cerebral cortex sometimes receives some recall signals or environmental signals. I'm going to give you an example of that. And then the answer to that, uh, the response to that uh, environmental signal or, or recall signals is, is called the behavioral output. Uh, these red dots, you can see, these are... Uh, these represent the potentiated synapses, and these asterisk uh, <coughs> signs here, uh, for example, you can see some of them here and uh, here, they actually represent active synapses. Okay, let's see how these work, how this model works, uh, but first I need to actually explain it uh, by using an example. Uh, imagine that my memory is to be assessed. I receive, uh, or let's say my uh, uh, cerebral cortex receives a, re a recall signal in a form of a question, where is the capital of France? I tell you that I, you know, I have to tell you I really hate geography and geology. I, I hate geology and geography as much as I love neuroscience and biology. So, yeah, I don't know why, but I just hate it. So, I never uh, paid attention to the capitals of countries. Uh, so, where is the capital of France? And my behavioral output, you know, I pass that recall signal through, uh, you know, some uh, circuits in my uh, cerebral cortex, and my behavioral output, my the answer to that question is going to be, uh, well, I don't know, London. Okay. Well, of course, this is wrong. After training, after uh, uh, you know, memorizing some facts about the capitals of uh, countries and, you know, uh, the capital of France. And after the ministrations of my hippocampus, my behavioral output is, to, is, is modified and is now uh, Paris, okay? So now I want to tell you how the hippocampus helps me to, to remember and to store that new information in my cerebral cortex and how it modifies my behavioral output. So I receive sensory input as new information, which is represented uh, uh, by the firing of my hippocampal neurons. Okay, so we, so some of my hippocampal neurons, you know, when I receive sensory input, of course, some of my um, uh, pyramidal cells in my hippocampus, uh, of course, fire. Uh, so I receive sensory input. Um, as new information, I told you, as for example, the capital of France is Paris. Then, then imagine that my geography teacher tells me that this kind of question, where's the capital of countries, is going to be on exam next week. So I receive, so now I know that new information I'm, I'm trying to memorize is important, okay? And I receive, because of that, I receive a blast of neuromodulatory signals because I pay more attention to it. And the simultaneous activity of my pyramidal neurons in CA, or hippocampal neurons, and uh, the presence of these neuromodulatory signals leads to the potentiation at one of my Schaefer collateral, collateral synapses in my CA1 area. Okay, so the simultaneous activity of, of, of my uh, hippocampal neurons in CA1 area and the and presence of that, that uh, neuromodulatory signal uh, well leads to the formation or induction or expression of uh, LTP or uh, basically potentiation at my Schaefer collateral synapses, at one of those Schaefer collateral synapses, for the sake of simplicity, you know, we say just one. And then, if I'm going to make this, uh, make it to the next week, okay, if I'm going to remember that memorized fact to the next week, okay, till the next week, I should receive a consolidation signal. Well, I told you that the consolidation signal is about the baseline neuronal activity, which is necessary for the consolidation of memories. I think it has something to do with, you know, that, uh, the, you know, the association with repetition and uh, storage of memory, you know. I think that uh, <clears throat> if I want to, you know, transfer that short-term memory into long-term memory, I need to activate this potentiated synapse by rehearsing and repeating the, n that new information, okay? And when I do that, it may act as a consolidation signal. And what this consolidation signal does is that it relays information, or sorry, the neuronal activity. It relays the neuronal activity, uh, including the newly potentiated synapse, through the hippocampus, throughout the hippocampus. And you can see that the heightened activity 
of one of my uh, hippocampal neurons is clear and manifest as the uh, potentiation of other synapses down the stream in the enterona and perirana cortex cortices and from there um, you know it, it is clear as the potentiation of uh, one of my uh, cortical synapses okay because that neuron that uh, neuron which um, and that synapse which is potentiated in my hippocampus is connected to other neurons and other synapses down the stream in the enterona and perirana cortices and also uh, from there uh, it is connected to other uh, synapses or uh, network of neurons in my cerebral cortex so when it when its uh, activity is high uh, heightened is potentiated the, uh, the the activity of other neurons which are associated with that neuron is going to uh, also be uh, is going to be um, heightened uh, as well <clears throat> okay and then late phase of LTP I think as a result of that consolidation signal again late phase of LTP is now established at a specific synapses uh, in my cerebral cortex and that late phase of LTP okay that uh, you know modified or potentiated uh, cortical uh, synapse participates in a network of neurons which is store information and I think that the network of neurons uh, which uh, store, uh, stores information is called memory trace or memory engram in our cerebral cortices, cortex. So, uh, and, and it's potentiated the state, the potentiated the state of that, uh, you know, uh, synapse in that memory engram or network of neurons uh, which is store information, stores information is going to alter my behavioral output when I pass a recall signal through its circuit. So that potentiated uh, synapse is going to modify, of course, uh, that memory engram. And when I pass a, or memory, uh, or memory circuit, can we say that? Yeah, I, th I think we can say that, memory circuit. Uh, and when I pass a recall signal through that modified memory circuit or memory engram, my behavioral output is going to be modified as well. So the next time I, re I receive that environmental signal as where is the uh, capital of France, my behavioral output is now modified because of the training and administrations by the help of my hippocampus and by memorizing new facts and my behavioral output now is modified and is now Paris, okay, instead of London. Well, in this particular model, you can see that after, you know, the uh, my, uh, that memory engram in my cerebral cortex stays modified and potentiated long after the, the, the duration of potentiation in my, uh, at my uh, hippocampus. You know, in this model, the circuits on my hippocampus uh, goes back to their unpotentiated state, okay? But in other models, for example, there is a theory of multiple trace theory uh, in which uh, there is a perpetual dependence of the memories uh, stored in the, uh, in the cerebral cortex uh, on the uh, potentiated circuits uh, in the hippocampus. So in another uh, theory, in another model, um, my hippocampal circuits stay potentiated. But in this model, they, uh, they rest, okay, and they uh, get back to their unpotentiated state and they're ready now for um, uh, forming new memories. There are various, uh, there are a lot of different um, models, and this is just one of them. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. So you see that you know LTP or um, you know synaptic potentiation is not memory. Okay, it's just a tool used by a very complicated cognitive circuit. Okay, for forming and storing new memories. Although I told you that, for example, one of the synapses in my hippocampus is potentiated or one of my cortical synapses is potentiated, but it's basically, it happens um, at the level of uh, circuits, okay, and that, or neuronal networks. For example, one of my, or a specific circuit in my hippocampus is changed, okay, some, some synaptic weights are changed in, in a specific circuit in my hippocampus, and the outcome of that uh, modified circuit or potentiated circuit in my hippocampus is going to cause long-lasting changes downstream in my enteronic cortex and from there um, in my cerebral cortex. And then by that mechanism, you know, I store information in my cerebral cortex. Uh, what is clear, uh, what is, you know, 
similar in all of these models is that uh, we don't have a specific, they all say that we don't have a specific part in the brain for storing memories. You know, our memories are stored in a network of cortical circuits, okay? <clears throat> That's a point I wanted to mention. So you can see that LTP does not equal memory. LTP is just a tool used by hippocampus and other uh, you know, cognitive circuits uh, in other areas, including the cerebral cortex, for, st for storing memories. OK. Uh, you know, we have the same uh, slide in the very first lecture in this series. And you know, I just wanted to tell you uh, you know, the relationship between the hippocampal circuit and the cortical circuits and, you know, the you know, processing circuit for, for storage of recent memory. So uh, in the previous model, we saw that the hippocampus receives, uh, uh, you know, sensory input and, uh, you know, neuromodulatory signals from different parts of the uh, cortex and different parts of the uh, associated areas like enteronic cortex. And the memory is formed in, in the hippocampus, in the circuits of the hippocampus. And that memory, which is formed in a, in a, in a, um, as, as a pattern of synaptic weights, okay, this is important. Memory and information is, represent, is represented in the hippocampus as a pattern of synaptic weights, as a patterns of, uh, pattern of potentiated synapses. And that pattern is somehow projected to the enteronic cortex, and from there, it is projected to other areas of the cortex where the memory is stored, okay? So this is, I just wanted to uh, review this as well. And now we know, uh, you know, uh, the story behind this uh, this beautiful drawing by uh, I don't know the art, uh, artist but it is from one of the uh, atlases by Dr. Frank Netter so now we know the story behind this okay thank you so much for watching this video I hope you enjoyed it well um, <clears throat> it was a this was the uh, main lecture in this series, but uh, in the next lecture, I'm going to talk. About, I'm going to introduce the uh, you know uh, mo brain marker circuits. I'm going to just talk about the general concepts of uh, related to brain marker circuits. And in the last lecture, I'm going to talk about the hippocampal marker circuits. So I hope you can watch them too. Uh, I hope you can watch all uh, other videos, and I hope you just enjoyed this video. Um, so thank you so much, and have a nice day.